Good evening and welcome. Tonight we will be going over the history and geography of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands are a territory of India and they are located right between the Bay of Bengal and appropriately named the Andaman Sea. India is just, you can kind of see the coast of India right here. You can see the, the names of the cities off the coast. You can see Sri Lanka's right here. Just up here is Myanmar, the mouths of the Irrawaddy River, delta up there. And just down south of the Nicobar is uh, the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, in particular the Aceh region. Tonight, we are talking about the very different history of these islands, very different from all of these surrounding countries. So as you can see, there are two different little archipelagos here that are part of one territory. Separating them appropriately named is the 10 degree channel, and that's because the line of longitude, right, longitude, of uh, 10 degrees goes right through this gap here, separating the Andamans to the north of it and the Nicobar to the south of it. So the Andaman Islands, you can see the main island chain here is South Andaman, Middle Andaman, North Andaman, all connected into one big island group here with lots of little islands around it. The capital here is Port Blair, a big bustling city. And little Andamans right down there. And there are a couple of important islands to note. The first one I find really interesting, I'll show you all Google Earth because it's so beautiful, is Barren Island. It's a huge volcano, I should say that. These are coral islands. These are the tips of mountains peeking up from below the ocean. So this one's a big old volcano. It's one of those that always seems to be just popping off constantly. And uh, from what I can tell, I was poking around on tourism websites, because there's a lot nowadays, I'll talk about it later, that you can like cruise around the island, but I don't think you can go on it. I think it's too dangerous. The other island is North Sentinel Island right here. If you know, you know it's a very infamous island in terms of um, geography and anthropology. I'll talk about that too during history, but it's very infamous. You've probably already heard of it. Once, if you haven't heard of it, once I start describing, you'll probably be going, oh, it's that place. So we'll talk about this island in a minute. The Nicobar Islands are very similar in terms of geography. You've got Great Nicobar, Little Nicobar, and lots of other little islands here. There is a little bit of tourism here, but not nearly as much as up here, because Port Blair is the main center of tourism. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to spoil the ending of the story. Let's get into its history. There are many different flourishing tribes living in both archipelagos. People living up here are typically referred to as Andamanese, and people down here surprisingly are referred to as Nicobaris. Um, cultures are similar in that most of them never really progressed past the Iron Age very primitive hunter-gatherer lifestyle, uh, very like jungly, tribally kind of cultures with um, some interrelated languages. They had some contact with other powers around them. Um, the Chola Empire in southern India had a couple of little 
hideouts in the Andamans. Um, they had contact with um, the many different kingdoms and empires down in what's now Indonesia. And even Marco Polo mentioned the islands in the book about his travels. So I don't think he went here, but he definitely sailed nearby and mentioned them. In 1756, Nicobar Archipelago here became a Danish colony. With Denmark having a moment like, well, we're going to form our own East India Company snatch up what we can and they snatched up these islands but it was very very unsuccessful they kept uh, quitting any kind of development here due to malaria and trying again after a couple of years and then quitting and trying again and quitting so eventually they quit for good in 1848 when they sold the islands to the british they'd been up for sale for a while they had a, a tricky time selling them, but this time, of course, Britain is trying to gobble up as much of India as possible, so they wouldn't turn down that opportunity. Also because the British already had a firm grip on the Andaman Islands, they thought that using this big island chain here was a good place for a penal colony for all the uh, pesky Indians over in the subcontinent trying to resist their rule. So they started bringing prisoners over in 1789, and as a result, they founded Port Blair. But it wasn't until 1857 that they really started to go all in on the penal colony aspect, and they built the cellular jail in Port Blair different kind of name, the cellular jail, but that is because the entire prison complex was made up of solitary cells. So everyone that they imprisoned from India were put in solitary confinement. And let me tell you, by the time this prison was done being built, it was absolutely massive and terrifying, I'm sure. Gosh. You can just imagine all of the atrocities and cruel things that were done to these prisoners who were only trying to, you know, push for independence from Britain or trying to relax their grip on the country a little. And they were sent here where many lost their lives or um, became very unwell. There were riots, there were escapes, they all ended very poorly for the prisoners. So, guess who led the protest to shut it down? It was, of course, Bapu himself, Mahatma Gandhi. One of his many protests was to close the cellular jail in Port Blair, and it was successful in 1939. It was abandoned. But that left it open for someone else to swoop in. Surprisingly, someone even more cruel than the British Raj, it was the Imperial Japanese. In World War II, they invaded the islands in 1942, and, you know, they did what they were best at at the time. Um, really extreme atrocities, taking advantage of this huge empty jail to do um, demonetization things. I don't mean to giggle, I'm just, you know, how do you describe what happened without getting demonetized and without stressing out my listeners? You know, I'm relaxing you, I don't want to talk about war crimes, you know. So pretty much just think of any horrible thing you heard of Imperial Japan doing to the countries they occupied, they did it here. It was bad. It was very, very bad. They didn't leave until after Japan surrendered in October 1945. Uh, Britain wanted to keep a hold on the Andamans, but of course India, at that point, 
just before it was becoming its own thing was like no way the British had to get out and in 1956 it became a territory of India both sets of islands as one big territory now a couple of things will happen in more recent history the biggest being the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami or the Boxing Day tsunami devastated this entire area of coastal regions and islands and uh, the Nicobar and Andamans were no exception. Some islands were completely covered by the tsunami. Uh, a lot of the coastal regions were absolutely destroyed. Point Port Blair was wrecked. But here's one thing that came of it. At the time, the Indian government, I think it started with the British, but the Indians picked right up where they left off. They were assimilating the main indigenous culture of the Andaman Islands here. I'm trying to, you know, modernize them, making them live in homes, have modern customs, live modern lifestyles, learn their languages, all, all of the above, you know. And it, here on the islands, they're known as the Jawara. But there are many all throughout the islands here. Especially in the Nicobars, there's lots of different cultures there. And it was, as you can imagine, going extremely poorly for these indigenous peoples, just trying to live their lives. They were dying rapidly, mainly of diseases brought by all of these people coming to their islands and building all of these western style buildings and they were uh, not doing well like uh, I know the Indian government was worried about some of these tribes going extinct but the 2004 tsunami destroyed all of the Jarawa houses that had been built in Port Blair the Jarawa when they saw the ocean receding from the beaches, knew exactly what was happening, and they all fled inland. And from what I understand, they had like a 99% survival rate because they knew exactly what to do, you know. So all of their um, homes here that had been built for them had been destroyed. So they just stayed in the interior. And the Indian government has accepted that and said, listen, you know, they, I think they're still technically Indian citizens, but they have their own special rights. They are going to live their lifestyle in the interior. People aren't allowed to bother them. You're not allowed to go up and see them. You're not allowed to photograph them, you know, interact with them significantly. Um, I was watching, no, sorry, I was reading a New York Times article where the guy who wrote it saw some jar was like crossing by in the woods with a pig they had killed and they made eye contact for two seconds and he was like it was the greatest part of the trip to see these people but you're not allowed to treat it as a human zoo you know you just have to leave these people alone you know they tried for a good 200 years to assimilate these cultures and it failed worse and worse as the years went on so they legally have the right to live their indigenous lives in the interior, not near the coast where all the cities and things are. Another important thing that I mentioned before and have been mentioning is the tourism industry has exploded in Port Blair in the past 10 years or so. It's a massive industry. You know, I was looking through it. They have apps there's one island here, um, Havelock Island is their colonizer name. They've been changing it. Um, they've been slowly but surely changing all the names of the islands from their colonizer names, named after various white, oppressive British men, um, to more indigenous names. But that island has its own app that I guess you download and book your scuba diving expeditions through. It's a massive industry. They have all kinds of tourist activities to do in Port Blair. From, of course, the beaches, 
scuba diving, like I said, lots of things to see in town, like museums, dining, etc., and lots of cruises out to the various islands. And like I said before, the Nicobar Islands have a bit of a tourism industry, but it's absolutely nothing compared to up here. It's night and day, to be honest. You can cruise down and see them, but you're just going to beaches that, for the most part, are untouched, which is fun. But, um, it, it's not touristy, you know, it's not gimmicky. You can't buy tchotchkes there. Lastly, it's time to talk about North Sentinel Island, speaking of tourism. So, as mainly the British were going island by island, asserting their dominance, they had some troubles on North Sentinel Island because the indigenous people here were different from the rest. They spoke a different language and they were very tribal from what we can tell, hunter-gatherer, bows and arrows and spears and canoes and things. And contact with them has been very off and on throughout the years. There's been times when people come in peace with coconuts and goods to give them and the sentinelese they're known as are very accepting and excited and there's times where people come to learn about the cultures and they're extremely violent and they throw spears and shoot arrows at the people and threaten them. There was a very harrowing moment where a Chinese ship got stuck on the coral around the island and the sentinelese were trying to invade their ship, which sounds like a horror movie to me, Uh, but everyone on the ship was rescued, and slowly but surely the ship had to be broken down, and the Sentinelese weren't, for the most part, weren't too pleased about people coming to their territory. And there was one moment recently where a Christian missionary had the idea to come here and convert people, and he wound up um, being unalived by the Sentinelese. There's been a couple of people that they've taken out and have kept their bodies. We can't recover them. So the Indian government has forbade anyone from approaching and especially contacting the people of this island. Strictly forbidden. One, because you could be unalived by them. And Two, because they don't want what happened to the Sentinelese. Did I say that wrong? They don't want what happened to the people of the other islands to happen to the Sentinelese. I said it backwards. They don't want these people to be decimated by disease. They don't want them to um, be forced to westernize, etc., etc. They are left alone. The last point that we know of, I think the rest are deep in the Amazon, where there is an uncontacted tribe of people living as hunter-gatherers, having no idea about anything beyond the shores of their island. No concept of anything other than the airplanes and ships and things that they've seen. There's a famous photograph of a, uh, I think it was a think, or some kind of aircraft flew over after the tsunami just to see if there were any signs of life, and a hunter came out and pointed his bow and arrow, you know, ready to fire it at the aircraft. And it's a really striking photograph. But, for the most part, that is the history of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Let me show you a couple of places on Google Earth. So a lot of these islands are just islands with forest, and there's not much to see on them, so I'll show you what I have found. I'm gonna slide this over so it's not really... Okay. So, let me zoom out a bit. You can see exactly where we are in the world. Here's the islands here. India. Oops. I've tapped on... Ghana. Interesting. Uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia here. And you can see how close Banda Aceh is to the Nicobar Islands over here. 
So let's start off in Port Blair. Here we go. A big bustling town and lots of things pop up to do and see. Lots of museums. It's a cool museum here. Lots of little quaint beaches here. Let's look at Corbin's Cove. I know this is one of the big tourist beaches. Very typical tourist beach, right? Lots of activities, warm waters, food and water activities, sights to see, all the typical tourist stuff like touristy, um, what do they call them? Dives, dive restaurants, things like that. But then you can tour the cellular jail you can see what's left of it. It branched out like this, and these were all rows of cells. Let's take a look. Of course, now it's a museum. They do all kinds of events. See all the jail cells there? Yeah, this is what it looked like in its heyday. All of these were cells for political prisoners. Look at that. It's so stark and it, it's one of these places like if these walls could talk but you can almost kind of feel that just misery and human suffering happened within these walls like you can just feel it you know but now you just get to explore it yourself there's one of the cells oh it must have been horrific like all lit up in the Indian colors. That's nice, I suppose. Yeah, they do all kinds of little light shows and things. Mostly to teach about the history of the jail. It's all very respectful from what I can tell. All the different shows and things. But yes, there's lots to see. There's some neat memorials over here. We'll look at the Tsunami Memorial. Um, a little, in San Francisco we called it the Embarcadero, like the, the place along the sea where you stroll and there's lots of modern art and memorials and, um, what are these called? Like, sea walls, I suppose, that you can walk out and look at at the views of the ocean, things like that. So there is a lot to see here. I'm not going to show you all of it. I encourage you to explore it yourself. Because, um, yeah, the, the museums and things are neat, but um, I'm not going to show you any tonight. You can see the interior here, where the, I know they delineated the Jarwa Reserve, but I don't know if it's going to pop up. Somewhere deep in here, I don't know if I'm gonna find it. Oh, there's the Charo Tribal's Welfare Office. There's probably no pictures for that. Yeah. But I'll show you. Let's look at this national park. There's no pictures of it. How about Deer Park? Oh my gosh, it's full of little deer. That's not a good one. Maybe this one? Sure. Just to kind of show you the, the the jungle interior, what it looks like. That's what the crocodiles look like. Looks like you can rent some boats here and explore. Oh, there's a real crocodile. Be careful of that chomper there. So yes, even out here, it's quite it it's it's touristy. It's all set up for tourists to explore. Crocodile infested area, do not get into water. Apparently, the islands here have wild elephants too because when the area was being developed, they brought over elephants to, like, you know, lift things, how elephants do. And they just kind of let them go when they were done building. So there's elephants here as well. How cool is that? We can see. I think that's it right there. North Sentinel Island, which that's what it looks like. And 
Of course, there's no pictures of it. They're just pictures from above. There we go. Uh, I'm going to link in the description um, a documentary by the greatest documentarian on YouTube, the great Gino Samuel, did a, a documentary about North Sentinel Island. You should check it out. But let me, actually, let's look down here at the nickel bars before we head over to um, Barren Island. Oops, I almost wound it up in There are little towns here, of course. There's little parks. There's beaches. Let's see if there's pictures here. Yep. See, all very, like, primeval, I want to describe it. Like, very untouched jungle down here. Oh, that's a weird picture. There we go. Like, you can have tourist things here, but it's not really built for tourists like the Antamins are. Maybe someday. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, right? There's a little nickel bar. All very jungly. I'm pretty sure all the other indigenous groups. Let's look at Kevin's Island. Come on, Kevin. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> if you're Kevin, that's your island. Every Kevin can claim it. Comment below if you're Kevin. Um, but I forgot what I was saying. Yeah, is it a good or a bad thing that tourist stuff happens? So this is, it's now Swaraj Dweep, it's officially called. But this is, let's find a picture, Havelock Island. Uh, it's been known until recently when they renamed it. But um, apparently everything here still says Havelock Island all over but this is the island with its own tourist app that you can book activities through. It's very pretty. Oopsie, welcome to Havelock. Lots of coral you can see underwater. And doggos on the beach. What was I looking at? There's a spot somewhere around here. Maybe it was this. No, where there was, oh, there's the lighthouse of Lighthouse Point. Scuba diving lessons, or just, you know, snorkeling, I should say, not scuba. There's a difference. Canoeing, where was it? Jet skiing. There was a spot that I found that was clearly set up for tourists to scuba dive who's, who have never been scuba diving. Like you would put on a big diving bell helmet and you would just go straight down and see all the coral and then just come straight up. It was somewhere around here. It looked really cute. Lots of little families um, enjoying going underwater like a real scuba diver. It was cute. Let's close it out by looking at Barren Island. Look at this guy. Look, you can see just how much this guy has blown its top how much it's sunken in. And we can look at some smoky pictures while I close out the video for you. Thank you so much for watching. Froggo. If you enjoyed this style of content, please consider subscribing. This is an ongoing series on my channel, and next we are going to hop over the Bay of Bengal and see some of the mainland, India. Be sure to subscribe so you won't miss out. Ooh. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a good 